This video is going to focus on statements of logic written in conditional, converse, biconditional uh, formats, and also we'll discuss how to write proper definitions. A conditional statement basically involves two parts. The first part being, being the hypothetical, if that should come true, and then the second part being the conclusion, assuming that the hypothetical does come true. This is the form for conditional. If P, then Q. And symbolically, it would be like this. P happens, and that implies Q will happen also. The first part is called the hypothesis, or hypothetical, meaning if that should occur, then, then this conclusion will result. Now, the converse, or reverse, means is basically written in the same manner. If something should happen, then that causes something else to result. The only difference is, is that with the conditional, the converse is written in, in the opposite manner. So the conclusion for the conditional now becomes the hypothetical or hypothesis. And the hypothesis for the conditional now becomes the conclusion. Now, if the converse is true, then it's okay to write what is called the biconditional. In the biconditional, the biconditional simply states that um, that we can go either way. To separate the two, the hypothesis and the conclusion, we use the phrase if and only if. Symbolically, it means this. That means from left to right or right to left, we still get the same meaning. Is it okay to put what was originally the hypothesis second? and the conclusion first? Yes, it is, because again, this is reversible. This can be written in either order, and it would still have the same meaning. Let's do an example. Let's say that we have an angry mom here, and the angry mom says, if you clean your room, then you can go to the movies. What would the hypothesis be, the hypothetical? Hypothetically, it would be that you clean your room, because Let's face it, that hasn't happened yet, which is probably why she's screaming. The conclusion would be that if you clean your room, that you can go to your movies. So hypothesis, conclusion. Now for the converse. What would the converse be? Well, the converse, again, would have the hypothetical become the conclusion, and the conclusion become the hypothetical. That is... If you go to the movies, then you can clean your room. Now, is the converse statement a true statement here? Well, I think every, I think moms all across America would probably conclude that this converse is never going to be true. Therefore, it would be improper to write this as a biconditional statement. Okay, let's do an example that's more geometrically focused. If two planes are parallel, then they do not intersect. This is our given conditional statement. So based on that, what is the hypothesis and what is the conclusion? Well, the hypothetical is that the two planes are parallel, as I have, as I have them here drawn for you. And the conclusion would be that they do not intersect. So what would the converse be? Well, the converse would be that instead of that being the conclusion that they do not intersect, that would be the hypothetical, and the conclusion would be that the two planes are parallel. Now, I think most English teachers would agree that we don't begin a sentence with a pronoun and then finish later with an actual noun. So let's reverse, let's readjust this. Better. I think your English teacher would agree with this a lot more. They is no longer first like we had here. It is now It is now uh, last, and two planes, which was second, is now first. Now, is this a true statement? It, in fact, is. If two planes do not intersect, they are, in fact, parallel. So now it's okay to go ahead and write the biconditional statement. Recall that the biconditional statement has the phrase, if and only if, 
between the hypothetical and the conclusion. So therefore, we can write two planes are parallel if and only if they do not intersect. Now, by the way, is it okay to have this in reverse order with the conclusion first that they do not intersect? Sure, and we can also put that the two planes are parallel being second. So uh, let's do that. Let's rearrange these so that this goes first and this goes second. And oh, by the way, we do want to have two planes here in the beginning and then they at the end. So let's do that and clean this up with punctuation and capital letters. And there we are. Definitions. Exactly what makes a definition quote unquote proper? Well, a proper definition would be one that's reversible, meaning that you have one statement and then you can reverse the, pro the, the statement around and it would still have the same meaning. It is biconditional, and in a sense, biconditional is also a reversible statement because you can have the hypothetical go f not just first, but also second, and the conclusion in for, uh, go first. We also want to use precise terms, terms that are not vague or unclear. Let's do an example. Here you have what are called polyglobs. Polyglob, by the way, is not a real term. If you were to look this up, uh, in a dictionary or Google it, you probably wouldn't find much of anything for it. So we're making up this term, but here you have three examples of what we're calling a polyglob and then three non-examples. So analyzing these, what characteristics do these three have in common? And these three here should help you confirm that. So what do they have in common? Well, all three are round, so maybe that's it but you'll see that all three of these are round as well, so that's not good enough. You may notice that all three have three eyes, and they're in the triangular arrangement. This one does too, but this one does not, and this one has three piercings, so we might be onto something with the three eyes, but perhaps there's something else. Whereupon you should be seeing that all these have three legs as well, and they hang down. This has four, this has three, and this has three as well. So we're seeing a, a, a particular combination. You gotta have the three eyes and you gotta have the three legs simultaneously in order to be considered a polyglob. Therefore, a good definition would be a polyglob is a comb-shaped creature with three eyes and three legs. And I added in comb shape just to be a, a little more descriptive. So now that we have a definition Can you tell which of these are polyglobs? Well, this has two eyes, and we say that ours has three, so this would not work. Neither is C. Even though it does have three eyes, it does not have three legs, and that's part of our definition as well, that it has to have both the three eyes and the three legs. Therefore, you can see that B is the only thing that worked. Now, this is a pretty common sense exercise. However, please keep in mind that we are writing the definition, we are not exactly identifying them. So if someone else were to identify something based on your definition, there should be, um, there should be no contradictions in it. So let's look at some bad definitions. Exactly what's wrong with them? Well, this first one here, what's not good is the word good. Let's try again. What's not good is the word good. The word good here is vague. It's not very precise. Remember, that's one of the conditions that we have to meet. I mean, think about it. If a student is a good student, there has to be a collection of traits and such. And at a certain point, that student would have to cross into the line of what is considered good. But what exactly that is, we don't know. At what point does a student become good? And exactly what are good grades? For some students, a C is a good grade, whereas for others, a C would get them grounded. So that's unfortunately not precise enough. Now let's look at the second example. A rich person has a lot of money. What's wrong with this is the same, is the same thing. A lot. A lot is vague. 
We don't know how much a lot is. At what point does one person become rich? Are you not rich if you have one million dollars? But if you have one million dollars and one cent, you now are suddenly considered rich. The IRS does that, but for us that wouldn't work for a good definition. Now what about the third one? A cat is a furry creature with whiskers. Well, the problem with this one is that it's not reversible. Remember, a good definition can be written in reverse, meaning that instead of having the cat being a furry creature with whiskers, well, this is the first part here, cat, second part, furry creature with whiskers, is is our separator, so I'm going to reverse this and then see if it makes sense. We'll have cat here at the end. And here we are. So a free, furry creature with whiskers is a cat. Now, if you're looking at that definition and thinking, you know what, I can think of at least one, at least one con uh, counterexample to that. If that's the case, then the definition doesn't work for us any longer. So that's what's wrong with these definitions. Again, please keep this in mind as you write them. It's got to be reversible. It's got to be biconditional. And we want to use precise terms. We want to avoid terms like good or a lot or even large, like a whale is a large animal. That wouldn't work either because at what point does an animal become large? That's it for this one. I'll see you next time.